Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mike McKenna. I'm an AMSAT certified teacher of the Alexander Technique. And today I'm going to present a class for you that I've entitled Healthy Musician, an Introduction to the Alexander Technique. And this class is going to go through a few different sections. Um, we're going to do an introduction in which I give a general uh, explanation as to what the Alexander Technique is. Um, as well as introduce you some, to some of the key ideas about the Alexander Technique. Uh, from there, we're going to do some exercises. We're going to do some active standing, active sitting, and we're going to do the sit-stand movement with the hope that um, you can feel for yourself what it's like to move with your body being completely integrated. Um, from there, we're going to talk about slouching, and we're going to introduce some strategies for getting out of slouching, um, even when you're feeling low energy. And from there, we're going to talk a little bit about constructive thought, and then we'll have a conclusion that um, sort of summarizes all the ideas that we're talking about today. So if you are ready to go, let's get going. What is the Alexander Technique? The Alexander Technique is one of those modalities that just by looking at its name, it doesn't really tell you too much about it. Um, so I'm going to give you a really short definition to begin with of what the Alexander Technique is. The Alexander Technique is mindfulness in activity. So what this means is that with the Alexander Technique, we're hoping to increase our awareness and we're hoping to increase our awareness of what's going on inside of our bodies, and we're also hoping to increase our awareness of what's going on in the environment around us. So that's a good short definition for what the Alexander Technique is. A slightly longer definition for the Alexander Technique is the Alexander Technique retrains habitual patterns of movement and posture. Poor habits of movement and posture impair self-awareness as well as health. Improved movement efficiency supports overall physical well-being. And AT is primarily a mental training. With this definition, we see that we're looking at our habits. Our habits are the things that we're doing all the time and we're not even aware that we're doing them. They're the things that just happen automatically. And uh, we're hoping to replace old, maybe not so great habits with better habits. And there's also the note there that AT is primarily a mental training. So we see the effects of the Alexander Technique with our physical bodies, but it's really the thinking that we're doing that causes the changes in our physicality. So how, do, how does one develop new habits? Well, new habits are developed in exactly the same way as your old habits were developed, and good habits are developed in the same way as bad habits are developed. It's through repetition. So that which you do today, you're more likely to do again tomorrow. So this is a photo of F.M. Alexander. He was born in 1869 in Australia. Um, he was an actor, and he was an actor who ran into some trouble. And the trouble that he had is that he started losing his voice. And he found out from looking in a mirror that the thing that was causing his vo him to lose his voice was that um, he was tensing other parts of his body. So he was tensing his feet, his torso, and his arms while he was trying to speak. And that was causing problems in his throat. And so this is where he came up with his idea of the whole body working all together as one thing. And it kind of goes against the modern medical model of the body where if we have a problem with the throat, we go and we operate on the throat. But that wouldn't really take care of the problem if the throat problem is being caused by something that we're doing someplace else in our body. So um, Alexander had a really cool idea about um, what we're made up of and he called it the self. And the self is made up of the body the mind and the awareness. He said that these things can seem separate, but they're actually completely connected and um, affecting one another. Uh, the Alexander Technique, it teaches us to consider how we are doing things. In AT, we call how we're doing things our use. So we're using ourselves 
the same way that we might use a tool like a hammer you use it or how you use your car and I'm sure we've all known people who use their possessions in kind of a rough way so like a friend who always has a, a cracked telephone screen or their car is always breaking down so just the same way that we can use our possessions in kind of a rough way we can also use ourselves in a way that they get injured and break down more quickly and we want to do just the opposite we want to use ourselves uh, to promote, promote more ease and greater health throughout our life so that's the concept of the use of the self that was the title of one of FM Alexander's books and the way we use ourselves affects our functioning and it affects how we feel so in the Alexander technique we hope to use ourselves in accord with how we're designed and with appropriate tension. So we have a design of our bodies that um, we've inherited. It's not up to us. And there's certain rules about how the body moves that um, really affect our ability to move with ease. And if we know how the body moves well, we can use those to our advantage. We also want to be using the body with appropriate tension. So the gentleman, the military gentleman on the left, they're using too much tension in their bodies as they're standing. And the gentleman looking at his computer on the right is using too little tension as he's collapsing down and looking at his screen. And most of us are kind of fluctuating between these two states throughout the day. We're going from being overly tense to, to under tensed overly tensed to under tensed. And in the Alexander Technique, what we're hoping to do is find that middle ground where there's appropriate tension for the job at hand. I'm sure we've all experienced um, the, the experience of having a, like a pencil in your hand and you catch yourself and you're like, whoa, why is my hand so tense as I'm writing? Or with a coffee cup, why, why am I using so much extra tension? Or maybe a steering wheel. Why am I holding on to it for dear life? So what we're hoping to do is increase our awareness of what we're doing with ourselves when we notice that we're over tensing to let go. So some of the use challenges for musicians are that it's very competitive. You need to perform before an audience. There's challenging pieces. There's extremely long pieces and there's repetitive movements. And all these challenges can have the effect on a performer that they start to close in on themselves. They, they tighten in on themselves. And in the Alexander Technique, what we want to learn how to do is to open back out, to expand out into the challenges of life. Injury among musicians is fairly common. It has to do with that closing in on ourselves. And the type of injuries that musicians are getting most commonly are repetitive stress injuries. That's from having too much tension in a particular area and doing something over and over and over again. Now there's an old idea in music that if you have a, a sore spot that you should just keep playing through the pain and that eventually that pain will go away. And while that's true, the reason that that's true is, is not very good because what the body does is it sends out those pain signals for a while, but if you're not listening to them, it eventually just stops sending the pain signals. And that you're really setting yourself up at that point for potentially injuring yourself very badly. And that's the reason that um, Alexander Technique is taught at so many music conservatories around the world, because the information that the Alexander Technique provides can help a musician to prevent becoming injured. So there's two main things that the Alexander Technique can do for musicians. Number one, the skills learned in the Alexander Technique can help a musician reach their fullest potential. And two, the skills learned in the Alexander Technique can help a musician avoid repetitive stress injuries. So what we want to move toward, what we hopefully want to become, is a whole body musician. Meaning that we're playing our instruments with our entire bodies. It's not just our fingers that are on the keys that are playing the instrument. And it's not just our, you know, the breath coming out of our body that's blowing into the horn or the flute, but it's our entire body that's engaged with the instrument as it's making music. Learning to use ourselves more mindfully 
it just feels better. And this skill of the Alexander Technique can be applied to all areas of one's life. That's why I like to say that the Alexander Technique is the most useful thing that someone can learn, because in each moment of someone's life, it's possible to improve your experience of, of being there. The first exercise that we're going to do today is called active standing. So go ahead and stand up. And the first thing that I'd like you to become aware of is gravity. So we're standing in gravity all the time. Most of the time we don't notice it. But right now, the weight of your head, neck, torso, arms, legs, they're all coming down into your feet. And see if you can notice the contact that your feet are making with the ground. There's three points on the bottom of your feet that I call the push-off points that I'd like you to become aware of. They're right before the ball of the big toe, right before the ball of the little toe, and at each of your two heels. So there's six points that I'd like you to be aware of on your two feet. And see if you can just locate those points and start to move between them. So it's kind of like you have tripods on each of your two feet and you're just rotating around on those points. And so we have some old ideas about standing, that it's a position or that you should put all of your weight onto one leg. But with this act of standing, what we want to be thinking about doing is moving a little bit all the time. So it's kind of like you're in, a, in an orbit or a tiny dance all the time. And as we practice this in the beginning, we make big movements so that we can feel the, check out the whole range of motion that's available to us. But eventually, you'll be active standing and no one will be able to tell. So the first thing to know about active standing is that we want to know where the weight is in our feet. The second thing to know about active standing is that we want to get moving. If you find yourself frozen, just start moving across those six points on your feet. The third thing to know about active standing is that we want to keep breathing. When we're paying attention to where our weight is in our feet, we can oftentimes get concentrated and stop breathing. So just go ahead and take a big breath. So we're moving, we know where our weight is, we're breathing. So the fourth thing to know about active standing is that we are springing up from that down contact, okay? So we're not making contact with our push-off points and just going down, but instead, it's like we're bouncing off of that contact. It's a very buoyant, lively relationship that we have with the ground. So once again, we are moving, we're breathing, we know where the weight is in our feet, and we're springing up from the down contact. Now, I'd like you to be aware that there is a separation in the human body, and in that separation, the legs are going down, but the pelvis, torso, arms, and head are going up. So the legs are going down, while the pelvis, torso, arms, and head are springing up. And we can think about the legs springing down and everything else springing up. The next thing that we're going to do is something that I call swimming the spine upwards. And what we're gonna do with this is we're still active standing, but we're gonna take our arms and we're gonna swing them up. And we're gonna imagine that we're underwater and that the surface is up there and we want to get up there. So we're going to bring our arms down and we're going to send our spine upwards. 
The arms come down and the spine goes up. So once again, swing your arms up and send your spine upwards as the arms come down. And the part that's going up, it's right here at the top of your head, okay? So this is where you're sending your spine up toward. It's up toward the top of your head. Send the spine upwards as the arms come down. And let's do it one more time. What we're doing here is we're lengthening our spine. And human beings move really well when they have a lengthened spine. So let's come back to active standing. So you know where the weight is in your feet. You're moving across those push off points. You're remembering to breathe. You're springing up from the down contact. And now let's allow that feeling to come into your arms just a little bit. So you're moving your arms along with your body as it's active standing. And what we hear from people quite often when they start getting good at active standing is that it kind of feels like your seaweed. So you're very firmly grounded in your feet and everything up above kind of just feels like it's floating. It's just light as can be. And that lightness comes from your entire body being integrated and everything working together. Oftentimes when we move, we move just a bit or just one part of our body. So we're gonna move the arm and just the arm goes, or I'm gonna move my head and just the head goes. But in this type of movement, in this act of standing, everything is integrated with everything else. So you can kind of just make up your own Tai Chi, make up your own hula dance. It's kind of like dancing, but everything is integrated with everything else. And you're just enjoying moving your body. Okay, and so from here, let's uh, bring up an instrument, just uh, whatever instrument you play bring up an imaginary instrument and continue to have that seaweed feeling through your body as you play your instrument. See if this feels different from your normal stance, your normal position for holding your instrument. Remembering to breathe. You're still aware of where the weight is in your feet. Moving, breathing springing up from the down contact. The next activity that we're going to do is called active sitting. And so find a chair to sit in, preferably one that has a firm surface, because the first thing we want to do is make sure that we can feel our sit bones while we're sitting down. And this is really important for active sitting. Uh, they're called your ischial tuberosities, and they're right at the bottom of your pelvis. Um, so anytime you are doing an activity while you're sitting, it's a good idea to be sitting on your sit bones. So if you are playing a piano, or if you are working on your computer or eating, it's a good idea to be sitting on your sit bones. If you are laying on the couch at home, I wouldn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. That That's fine. But if your arms are in movement, it's a good idea to be sitting on your sit bones. So the first idea with active sitting is that we know where the weight is in our sit bones. So just, just sense where, where is the weight in your sit bones. The next idea for active sitting is that we get moving. Okay, so once again, sitting is an activity, it's not a position, we're not frozen as we're sitting, but we're moving a little bit all of the time. Okay, so you can check out the whole range of available movement. You can go over onto one sit bone only. You can come forward and feel the weight come into your legs, then to your feet. Go over onto the other sit bone. If you go back, you can feel the front of you tighten in order to hold yourself up. 
but you just have all this available space to move around. The next thing to know about active sitting is that you're breathing. So again, when we're thinking about our sit bones, we can become concentrated and stop breathing. So just take a big breath. See if you can continue breathing as you're doing your active sitting. And the next thing to know about active sitting is that you are springing up from your contact with the chair. It's a very lively relationship that you have with the chair, so you're not connecting with your sit bones and dropping down, but it's a very springy relationship. It's almost as though you could get up at any time off of your sit bones. It's a very dynamic, springy relationship that we have with the chair. Okay, so the torso is still springing up, springing upward, springing upward as we're sitting. So as we're sitting in the chair, let's once again do the swimming up the spine, swimming the spine upwards exercise. And so we're going to swing our arms up. The surface of the water is up there. We we'll bring our arms down. And we send our spine upwards. Swing the spine up. Let's get active once again in our sitting. And uh, so we know where the weight is in our sit bones. We're moving, we're breathing. We have a springy relationship where we feel like we could get out of the chair at any time with our sit bones. And then let's start moving our arms just a little bit. Again, moving your arms as you're active sitting. Let's see if we can get that seaweed feeling back where it kind of feels like your whole body is one thing, moving all together, firmly rooted down below, but everything else is just floating up above, easy as can be. And then let's bring up an instrument and see if you can keep that seaweedy, easy feeling in yourself as you play your imaginary instrument. You know where your sit bones are, you're moving, you're breathing, you have a springy relationship in your sit bones with the chair, and you're just playing. And see if you can bring even more ease to that playing. And now let's all imagine that we're playing a piano. We have a piano right in front of us and we're going to play it. But when we play this piano, what we're going to do is each time we play a key with a finger, we have a corresponding movement down in our sit bones. So for every movement of the finger, we're moving on our sit bones as well. And so the movement isn't just out here. It's actually going through our whole body. The whole body is involved with making music, playing the piano. And see if that feels different in terms of how the body is moving from your habitual way of moving. The next exercise that we're going to do is called the sit-stand movement. And in the Alexander Technique, we do a lot of sitting and standing from chairs. And um, the reason that we do this is because moving from sitting to standing is a really great way to improve our coordination. Um, we don't normally think about sitting or standing very much at all. In fact, we normally just find ourselves sitting in a chair and find ourselves standing without knowing how we got there because we're so strongly guided by habit through that movement. But by increasing our awareness of what we're doing while we're sitting and standing, we can really improve our coordination. 
We're going to begin today by going from standing to sitting. And what we're going to do is I'm going to demonstrate it for you, and then we're going to do the activity together. Okay, so if I'm standing and I'm going to go into a chair, um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm active standing. I know where the weight is in my feet, moving, breathing, springing up from the down contact. And then when it's time to get into the chair, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my hips back, I'm going to send my knees forward, I'm going to look down at the floor, I'm going to see the floor, and then I'm going to stay in balance all the way to the chair. When I arrive in the chair, I begin active sitting. So once again, the steps for going from standing to sitting are that one, I send my hips back, two, I send the knees forward, three, I look down, four, I see the floor, five, I stay in balance all the way to the chair. So let's do it together. Stand before your chair, and let's do some active standing. We're moving across those six push-off points on your feet. And what we're going to do to go into the chair is we're going to begin by sending our hips back. We send our knees forward. We look down at the floor. We see the floor. And then we stay in balance all the way down to the chair. When we arrive in the chair, we begin active sitting. When we're going to move from sitting to standing, the first thing that we want to do is what I call setting ourselves up for success. And that means making sure that your feet are in a good place for getting out of the chair. If your feet are way out in front of you, it's going to be quite difficult to get your weight into them so that you can stand up. So as a general rule, it's easiest if you have your feet closer to you and a little bit spread apart. That makes it a little bit easier to stand up. So the first thing that we do, um, again, I'm going to demonstrate and then we'll do it together, um, is you set yourself up for success. And then when it's time to get out of the chair, we hinge forward from the hips. We wait for the weight to come into our feet. And when it does, we look down, we see the floor, and then we push through the contact to come to standing. When we get to standing, we start active standing right away. We don't snap into place and be in active standing. So once again, for sitting to standing, you set yourself up for success. You hinge forward from the hips. You wait for the weight to come into your feet. You look down, you see the floor, and then you press through the contact to come to standing. So let's do sitting to standing together. So the first thing you want to be doing is active sitting. We're moving on the sit bones, we're breathing. Um, we have a nice lively relationship with the chair. And now we're gonna set our, our feet up for success. So bring them a little closer to you, a little bit wider apart than usual. And when it's time to get up, we're going to hinge forward from the hips and we're gonna be super patient. We're gonna wait until the weight of our torso falls into our feet and when it does we're going to look down at the floor we're going to see it and then push through the contact in order to come to standing when we get all the way to standing we're just going to start moving we're going to get back into our active standing so let's do this a couple more times together just just follow along with me as i get into and out of the chair a couple of times Okay, so I'm active standing, I want to sit down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my hips back, my knees forward. I look down, I see the floor, and I stay in balance all the way to the chair. Right away I start active sitting. Make sure that my feet are in a good place for getting up. And then I hinge forward from my hips. I wait for my weight to come into my feet. I look down, see the floor. Push through the contact to come to standing and active standing once again. So move your arms into your active standing just a little bit. And then once again, send your hips back, knees forward, look down, and stay in balance 
all the way to the chair. So the act of standing, act of sitting, and the sit-stand movement can all be put together into a daily practice that um, if we do this for just a few minutes a day, do some active standing, move into the chair, active sitting, coming out of the chair and back to active standing. While you're giving, giving yourself the messages on how you want to do it, can really go a long way to improving your coordination and affecting the quality of how you move through the rest of your day. You're just giving yourself a message, this is how I want to be moving. And it just takes practice, you know, it takes repetition. So next we're gonna look at some strategies to deal with slouching. Um, it's quite often that people that come for Alexander lessons uh, will report that they just they have bad posture, they're slouchers, they've tried to fix it, there's nothing they can do about it. And so what we're going to talk about is um, some ways to deal with slouching that are sustainable and easy to do. And we're going to look at it first while we're in a sitting position, so go ahead and sit down. And um, all our lives, we're told not to slouch. Most of us are. And um, we hear it from our teachers, we hear it from our parents. And so the first thing that I'd like you to do is just enjoy a really good slouch. Just go ahead and collapse down. And there's some comfort in the feeling of being slouched because it's kind of like, you know, you're off the hook. This is your time. Nobody's telling you what to do. Um, and so, for most of us, when we have enjoyed slouching, or we've been in a slouch position, uh, we've had somebody come along and say, hey, don't do that. So let's all respond to that negative feedback of slouching by coming up with a little bit too much tension. So go ahead and hold yourself up with a little bit too much tension. And you'll notice that this is pretty exhausting. And before too long, boom, you're back down to slouching. So there actually are some good reasons that we don't want to slouch, you know. Um, there's, there's several that I'm going to list for you here. The first is that when we're slouching, we're collapsing down onto um, all of our organs that are inside of our body. So all of your basic functioning, from your circulation, respiration, digestion, are all impeded from going down onto your torso. And the torso is an area that you can't really feel very much. And so you don't sense that you're uh, causing troubles for yourself because the body doesn't give you any feedback that it's a problem. Um, the second reason why slouching is not so great is that it impedes your breathing. And breathing is one of the two ways that we get energy. It's through our breath and through food that we get energy. So if you'd like to have more energy in your life, it's a good idea to keep the lungs with all of their available space. And the third reason that we don't want to be slouching is that we can't move well when we're slouched. So just like how you're frozen if you have too much tension, when we're collapsed, you're also frozen here and not able to move. And if you try to play an instrument while you're, while you're stopped, it really doesn't work very well. Okay, this part of my body is not participating in the movement. It's just the arms that are moving. And this is the recipe for repetitive stress injury that one part is stopped and another part is moving. When that happens, the moving part gets way too much tension across the joints and we end up with pain. So, if you find yourself slouching while you're seated, and let's go ahead and do that again, go into a slouch. The first thing that you can do to sustainably get out of the slouch is find where your sit bones are. So locate your sit bones and start moving on your sit bones. The next thing that I'd like you to do is to take a really big breath and see if you can fully inflate your lungs. And as you exhale, imagine that you're sending that breath up your spine and out the top of your head. So let's do that one more time. 
You can sense your sit bones. You get moving on them. Then you take a really big breath and send that breath out, out the spine and out the top of the head. And now notice as you're active sitting here that you can be up without any extra muscular effort at all. Just through inflating your torso with your lungs, you can get a pretty good up going. Now let's look at slouching while we're standing. The posture of collapsing down to look at our telephones is very, very common these days. And if you find yourself slouching while you're standing, and let's all go ahead and do it again. Let's go ahead and just slouch a little bit while we're standing. If you're slouching and you decide that you want to get out of it, the first thing to do is notice where the weight is in your feet. And we want to think about those push-off points in our feet and get moving across them just a little bit. And then once again, we're going to take a really deep breath into our lungs. And we're going to exhale up our spine and out the top of our head. Let's do it one more time. We know where the weight is in our feet. Take a big breath in. We exhale up our spine and out the top of our head. Incidentally, a good way to look at your cell phone without going down to it is to simply lift your hand up a little bit higher so that you don't have to go down to look at it. Just a reminder, as we're active standing, we do have that separation going on of the legs going down and the torso going up. So see if you can sense that while you're active standing. And this is a photo of a gentleman who looks pretty good in his active standing. The top of his head is at the top of himself and he's tending forward just a little bit into the environment, which is nice. The next thing that we're going to talk about today is constructive thought. And uh, remember at the beginning I mentioned that uh, this technique is primarily a mental training. Constructive thought, in general, is just thinking thoughts for your own benefit. So we're going to do a couple thought experiments right now. And um, just, just give it a try. Uh, you don't have to believe it. Just see how it works for you. And the first constructive thought that we're going to do today is we're going to go up into our minds and we're going to say to ourselves, I am doing a really good job. So let's go ahead and do that. Go up into your mind and tell yourself, I am doing a really good job. And just allow yourself to see how that feels in your body when you give it that thought. And let's do it one more time. Go up into your mind and say, I am doing a really good job. All right, let's try another one. This time we're going to go up into our mind and we're going to say, I am very brave. And one more time, go up into your mind and tell yourself, I am very brave. And just see what type of impact that has upon you when you give yourself that kind of message. And so the lesson here is that all the thoughts that we're thinking have an impact upon us. And when we become more aware of what we're thinking, and this type of constructive thought can make us more aware of what we're thinking, we can uh, be our own best friend rather than our own worst enemy by thinking thoughts that are truly helpful to ourselves and endeavoring to limit the amount of negative self-talk that we do. Another type of constructive thought we call thinking in activity. And these are all the thoughts that we were doing when we were active standing, active sitting, and sitting into a chair. Those are the thoughts that as you're doing an activity, you tell yourself, I'm going to send my hips back, my knees forward, look down, see the floor, stay in balance all the way to the chair. 
those thoughts are guiding your activity as you're doing it. If you weren't thinking the thoughts, you would immediately revert back to whatever habit it was, you know, what your normal habit is. So F.M. Alexander had a few, he called them directive orders that he used, he used for like any occasion whatsoever. And those directive orders were to let the neck be free, and that means free of tension, to let the head go forward and up, and to let the back lengthen and widen. So in general, what these orders were saying is that we want to open up as opposed to close down on ourselves. When we close in on ourselves, we're looking at repetitive stress. When we open up, we have much more freedom and ease. In conclusion, why do we learn the Alexander Technique? We learn the Alexander Technique for good health. Good health is priceless, and this technique lays the best possible foundation for good health. This was said by Patrick McDonald. He was a very famous Alexander Technique teacher. We learn Alexander Technique to improve our coordination. The exercises that we've been doing today are all about knowing where our weight is in gravity. And having good coordination is all about knowing where your weight is. Poise. If you know where your body is in space, that is, increased sense of proprioception, you're going to increase the amount of poise that you have when people look at you. Peak performance. We want to do the best that we possibly can, and the Alexander Technique really helps us achieve all that we're able to. And feeling good. Feeling good just feels good, and it's a huge benefit of the Alexander Technique. If you're interested in learning more about the Alexander Technique, I can recommend a book entitled The Alexander Technique for Musicians. It was written by the teachers at the Royal Conservatory of Music in London, and you'll see a lot of the ideas that were in this presentation today in that book. Okay, so that concludes the class. I hope you had a nice time. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching it, and I wish you all the best. Take care.